Chef René is a one-star Michelin star chef. He came originally from Germany in 2013. Chef René was recognized as one of the best chefs of America. After extensive apprenticeships in Europe, Chef Stein became the executive chef of Hospoda Restaurant in New York City. And of course, Jackson, Wyoming is fortunate to have Chef Stein as the executive chef at the Rose. And he is now also an adjunct professor uh, at Central Wyoming College. I will tell you that this fall, the culinary department of Central Wyoming College Jackson has embarked on an innovative condensed curriculum offered in the off-season months that provides practical skills essential for a successful career in the culinary industry. And the extensive winter and summer seasonal internships provided by local resorts and businesses are designed to offer training towards career paths for graduates. So I can tell you that um, I had the pleasure of meeting um, uh, Chef Rene Stein last night. Uh, an even greater pleasure was getting to eat his creations, first to observe them like this in all their beauty, and then to eat them. And I don't know if you know, but we stood outside the window of your <laughs> kitchen, and we watched him work last night as well. So we had a wonderful experience. So I can tell you from personal experience that this is a very talented, knowledgeable, experienced person. So thank you for coming, and please. Chef Rene Stein. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about uh, me and where I'm from. I, I was born in a small town called Wetter an der Ruhr. Tiny little um, town, um, more like a steelworks, coal mine uh, area. Um, my dad, my mom, uh, they ran a, uh, or they still run a barber shop. It has been in uh, tradition for like 130 years now. So uh, I was happy that my sister took over that, so I could uh, proceed that way. Um, so <laughs> um, yeah, so you know, coming from a small town like this, um, you know, with my dad, I would go to uh, our local butcher shop, our local baker. You know, um, back in the days when there's still all you had those all individual little stores, right? Not those ginormous uh, supermarkets. So and this is my wife calling me right now. Uh, <laughs> Uh, great timing. Um, <laughs> anyways, um, so what, um, this, I think this is where um, my passion for food came from. Um, my, you know, my dad cooked a lot at home most of the time. Um, and as I said, like, going to those little butcher shops, going to those little um, Atesian, um, like um, bakeries and um, you know, uh, meeting farmers uh, out there, that was just a great experience. Um, and then um, I would say I was like, 14, 15, um, you know, it was time to figure out, okay, do I want to, do I want to go forward and go to university, study something, or do I want to just, uh, just work right away? So, in, you know, in Germany, you usually start with like 15, 16, you start an apprenticeship. Um, um, I had, I had two things in mind. I wanted to either be a roofer or a cook. So, <laughs> I'm afraid of heights, so I skipped that roofer part. <laughs> Uh, and my dad had a good connection with a manager of a uh, hotel, and he, uh, he gave me the opportunity to take a look into the kitchen for a week. Um, so I did that, and um, it was great. It was a lot of fun. Um, I didn't really, uh, at that point, I didn't really understood what you can do in the kitchen. I just thought, hey, that's going to be fun. You do something with your hands, you create something, it's, it's, it's good. Um, so I started my apprenticeship, um, it's, uh, it's usually it's three years, uh, you work full time, uh, once a week you go to culinary school basically, um, and you actually get paid for it too. Not a lot, not a lot but you get some money. Um, so first year was, I was doing all right, I guess, you know, it was still like 16, 17, you still want to go out, hang out with your boyfriend, uh, with your friends and girlfriends, you know, go skateboarding and stuff, so you're not really that into it yet. Uh, but then um, in the second year, uh, my mentor at that time, he, he showed me a book of um, a three Michelin star chef called Dieter Müller in Germany. He was one of the really great guys, um, or still is. Um, and I looked at that book and I saw what you can do with food. And that absolutely blew my mind. I was like, wow, this is amazing. I want to do that. That's, you know, and th I think this, is when, this was the moment when I caught the fire. You know, and the, the passion really just came out. And I was like, wow, okay, this is, this is what I want to do. I don't want to... I don't want to work in a canteen. I don't want to do anything else. I want to be in the best restaurant in the world. 
you know, and maybe one day be one of the best chefs in the world. Um, so that gave me obviously the drive just to um, just to move forward. Uh, the, the place where I did my apprenticeship was really, really um, like classically tiny little hotel. You know, we we, we still. We still we didn't do anything everything from scratch you know we, we we bought like chicken soup and powder and stuff you know so um, but this this was for me even more like uh, um, like a motivation to get out there and and do the real stuff right so um, actually at that at that time I um, up the street from that uh, hotel there was a three mission a two mission star restaurant um, and I sent I think five applications or maybe maybe six. The, uh, after the sixth one, I finally got a phone call to come in for one day uh, to trial with them, which was an amazing experience, um, but they never called back. I was like, oh, great, thanks. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, so uh, at that time, you know, you're like, well, okay, what are you going to do? All right. So um, I, I applied at a, um, um, at a restaurant down in, in the south of Germany, um, a hotel as well. Um, where I just uh, started in a pastry compartment for one year. Basically, uh, we just did we did all the cakes, uh, everything from scratch. Um, that was basically another apprenticeship. Um, it was it was amazing. You know, um, it was really really tough though because my pastry chef uh, Beata Meyer, she was she was really really tough. You know, she would first day you would come in, um, you would stand at the, s the scale with all the ingredients, and she would just yell out the recipe to you. There's no written recipes. She would just say, okay, five eggs, five egg whites, 500 flour, sugar. And you just, okay. Now, first of all, you want to do that right. And second of all, you don't want to do that over. And the last thing you want to do is ask again about the recipe. <laughs> that's, 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 that was really not fun if you do that. You know? um, I think this is when I learned um, like, uh, like, you know, how, or that toughened me up, let's put it this way. Um, uh, she was. Uh, her husband was the chef, and she was the pastry chef. So um, both of them took me under under their wings and taught me really quality, um, you know, and uh, like those classic techniques, you know, like how to make a consomme, how to make a stock, how to how to make butter, how to make all those things, you know, that you uh, that I didn't really learn in my apprenticeship because that totally got vanished somehow, you know, with all the the processed food coming. Not only into our households, but also into the kitchens. Um, people don't know that anymore. But yeah, anyways, after after uh, this, uh, the pastry uh, thing, I went almost back home, uh, close to uh, my hometown, um, into uh, one Michelin star restaurant. Uh, that was my my first like, um, you know, my one of my mentors always uh, said um, that's the Champions League of the restaurants. You know, the Michelin star restaurants, Champions League, or probably like you have the minor league and you have the major league. That's major league. You know, so um, that was my first major league job. Um, so uh, we did a, we, that was a fine dining catering and also a fine dining restaurant. Um, so we did everything from five to 2,000 people who catered to those parties. Uh, you know, for me as a chef, really important to go through all those stages because, um, you know, you need to be versatile. You need to, to know all those things, you know. Now when somebody calls me and he wants a, a catering for 200 people, I can execute that the same way as I can execute a, um, a tasting for five people with 13 dishes. You know, so you, you just need that uh, as, a, as a chef. That's what I believe. You know, if you just stick to one thing, yes, you're good at it, but um, I don't think you can run a restaurant uh, uh, properly. Um, after, after that, I went back to Frankfurt, uh, south to Germany, Frankfurt. Um, I worked at the Tiger Palace, was one mission star for two years. Uh, first, first year was a garbanger, like a you know cold kitchen salads. Um, um, we had one salad. <laughs> no, we actually, we didn't even have a salad. Uh, it was basically, we had a, we had a you know uh, um, stone crabs, tartar, and all those beautiful things. You know, um, really labor intense too. We we were only open for dinner, but that was easy 16, 18 hours days sometimes. Um, we were just in that station. We were two guys. We would get stone crabs whole in every day. And we would have to do them every day for service, and that's that. That alone is a four-hour job. You know, you, you cook them, you, you break those little thingies out. Take them out. That's crazy. <laughs> awesome dish, though. It was amazing, but um, really painful at times. You know, um, but this is just how you learn it. You know, you have to go through all those things. Like in my opinion, uh, you know. Um, 
After that, I went on the uh, entremet, which is the, uh, basically all the sites, you know, the vegetables, starches and stuff. Um, that was the same thing. Two guys on the station, um, we did about 70, 70 people a night. Um, and we had a vegetarian menu and uh, a regular menu. So um, vegetarian menu was a seven course tasting and everything came from our station. And everything was made from scratch every day. So you can just imagine how much work that was, even with two guys. You know, we were just, sometimes we were just running around like, woo, we're never going to make it, you know? <laughs> but we always made it. This was, you know. You know, the last, you know, those things, what I learned there too is like, um, Martin Gershel, he was the, my, my chef there, he, um, he used classic French techniques and combined them with uh, a little bit more, or gave them a modern twist. So that was really, really uh, significant for me to, to, to work there for those two years. Um, uh, you know, the pickups of the, like, pickups, I'm talking like kitchen lingo. Uh, <laughs> like, you know, when, um, when he fires a table or something, you know, uh, it's, everything need, needed to be uh, super precise, of course. Um, you know, we had, we had, I don't know what, if you know what tourneying is, but if you, if you for example, we had tourneyed kohlrabi. So it's basically, you, you know, you basically just cut it into like little ovals. So we had one dish where we had approximately 40 little um, uh, kohlrabi pieces on one plate. That was insane. We, we had, we had, the good thing was we had, uh, we call him Katsimoto, that was our Japanese guy. He was so good with his knife, he would have the, the big kitchen knife and he would all day he would just go and tourne that stuff. So he was just like, oh, that's great, thank you. No, uh, otherwise we would have ne probably never made it. Um, uh, so there too, you know, th and this is probably one of those shows too where um, it started working with, uh, or we started working with the farmers surrounding. We had a guy called uh, Bauer Rutz, like Farmer Rutz. He came over uh, once a week, brought potatoes and carrots. Um, but that was, that was mainly it, what we really got from farmers there. Um, the rest was like everybody else did at that time, you know. You get langostinos flown in from Scotland. You get, you know, uh, wild salmon from Alaska. You get, you know, all from all over the world. <coughs> Truffle, caviar, the whole spiel that you just do in that uh, major league. Um, uh, after that, I went to uh, Juan Amador, which uh, at that time had two Michelin stars, um, and I was there for about two and a half years. After one year in, we got our third Michelin star, which was an awesome party, by the way. It was <laughs> a lot of champagne, but uh, no, it was just, you know, it's just great if, you know, um, you're doing, you're doing, uh, you're spending time in such a tight team. We were just six guys plus Mr. Amador, um, and we were spending, I was spending more time with them than with my girlfriend at a time, you know, uh, 16, 18 hour days, um, and you're working so hard for something, and then you get that, and it was just crazy, you know, we were super, we were almost in tears, there's so much, you get this reward, you know. Um, he, like, Mr. Amaro was uh, an extremely interesting person to work for. Uh, he was really, he got really personal if you don't function the way that you should have functioned. So he made, uh, probably once a week, one of us would cry in the kitchen. You know, and you don't really, you can't really just, you know, can't just go in a corner and just cry. You have to keep working because, you know, there are 40 people out there, you want to eat something. And, you know, and he's just going to make it even worse, you know. But, um, you know, it, it's not that I would like to, oh, I don't run a kitchen like that. You know, I, I barely yell. Um, like, I had my times, like, five, six years ago, I was, I was still on that Amador, uh, you know, um, train and, you know, just yelled. But I, right now, I just, you know, at that point, I'm, I'm thinking, if you start yelling, you don't know what you're doing. That's what I think. If you lose your temper, then there's something wrong. You are insecure, and this is why you're starting yelling right now. So, uh, with my experience now, you know, I have, I have I'm, I've seen so many things happening, you know, barely something is there that can really, like, shake me, you know. Um, but yeah, uh, I mean, that, that, was, that was a really interesting time. Um, he formed me into the like uh, probably 80% into the chef that I am now, basically, you know. Uh, like discipline, passion, focus, um, quality, um, cleanliness, you know, all those things, you know. You know, you know it's, it, it's not just about coming in there and cooking some nice food and uh, it's, it's, it's all of the uh, above, you know, like all the other things, you know. Um, 
like being a chef means you're, you're a teacher, you're um, a cleaner, you know, you're an organizer, you know, um, and, and then small parts of that is being creative um, and actually cooking that food, you know, so there's, there's so many things that come together to actually run a nice streamlined kitchen. Um, yeah, Mr. Amador was, was perfect like that, um, even though it did hurt a little bit. Uh, <laughs> which, you know, it was good. I, mean, I wouldn't be here with, without him, probably. Um, after that, um, actually with Mr. Amador, um, he was a guest chef at, in New York at the Chamber of Commerce, uh, I think 2008. He took me with him over uh, to New York um, as an assistant, so we were um, cooking a as uh, German asparagus dinner for, uh, I think, 340 people at the Hotel de Pierre. Um, so we were basically hanging out in New York, uh, prepping a couple of days ahead, but every night we would go out for dinner, which was amazing. You know, per se, W250, all those beautiful places, you know, and I didn't have to pay a dime, that was great. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You know, that's time. You know, you don't. That's the other thing of those major, uh, major league restaurants. You know, when, when you're a young, young cook, uh, you don't make money. Like uh, you barely make any money. You, you, you go there to learn. You know, if, you know, I could barely, um, I could barely pay my rent. Um, luckily, my girlfriend was a flight attendant. She made double what I made. Uh, so that that worked out quite, quite well. Um, but, and I think that this is something, maybe I come back to later to, but I think this is something that people uh, and young, young guys these, gay, these days uh, misunderstand. I, I think you have to, in order to be good, you have to learn from the best. And that means sometimes you have to take a, a pay cut, you know. Uh, uh, some of the young chefs these days, they expect to be a sous chef with 22 and be executive chef with 26 and make the big bucks. Uh, but they have no experience whatsoever. So um, th those things, you know, when I hear when I hear people talk like this, I'm, I'm cringing. You know, like like in Germany, you you never have. A, I've never seen a barely seen a sous chef with 25. You you ha you work your way up. You know, my first sous chef position was actually uh, um, with 26. So. You know, and this is just what it is. You, 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 you have to just go through all those steps to get there, you know. And nowadays, people just get thrown into those positions and call themselves a chef or a sous chef. And, and you know, every little minor little detail just, you know, um, like cutting corners or every little problem just shakes them up, you know, because they don't have the experience. You know, that's just what it is. Um, uh, where was I? Great. Uh, <laughs> Thanks, New York. Yeah, that was it. Asparagus dinner. That was it. Um, so yeah, we went to went there, and this is where I actually met uh, the executive chef of the at the golf course, Liberty National Golf Course, a really really nice fancy place, um, right behind Liberty State Park. So of, I think from like hole 18, you or you watch over Manhattan and see the uh, Liberty uh, Statue of Liberty. Um, uh, so I met this guy, and he offered me a job. Um, and basically, a year later, I, I I got into Jersey City and took that job at the golf course. Um, you know, I was as a kid, I was well, as a kid, you know, a teenager, I always wanted to go into the states. You know, um, we growing up with like skateboard videos and stuff, and all the skateboard videos are in in you know in America. I was like, I want to have to get to go there. So and here, here I am, not skating anymore because I don't have any time. Yeah. <laughs> And finally, being in Jersey City, which was great, um, and working at a golf course, which you know that was that was really interesting for me because that was my first management management position um, abroad. So we're managing now in a different language, you know that was really interesting. So and also coming almost fresh out of Amador school, um, like with that huge German accent, uh, you know, yelling in English. Uh, you know, some people didn't didn't really <laughs> didn't really get along with that that great. So we, but <laughs> uh, probably in the first three weeks, I had uh, I was in the office with the executive chef like three times, and he's just like, you got to really, you know, you have to make sure that you talk nicer to the people here, and you know. And so I, I was, you know, I'm still just going like I'm full of energy. I'm going in there, and he tells me cut the hours. I cut the hours. I go in there and just make sure, here guys, let's go. You know, go crazy. You know, but our employees were not really that, uh, that happy about that. So uh, anyways, this is where I learned how to manage and got a little calmer too, manage uh, in English and, um, um, and smarter. 
I would say. You know, as I said, like being a chef, that's the other thing too. Like you're a teacher and a manager. Um, especially if you're running a team, we had a team of uh, 12 to 14 people at times. You know, where we 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 had a, a, the Barclays there, we, where we we catered almost 2,000 people a day. So we had a team of almost 20 people. You know, and that was really interesting. Um, it was fun. Uh, but yeah, that's, this was my first station. Um, uh, you know, golf course is not really that much. You you, you can't do that at a golf course. <laughs> you know, we had we had we had uh, like I don't even know. We had like Justin Timberlake and all those big guys coming over and playing golf. But all they wanted is a hot dog and a beer. <laughs> you know, it was it, it, at the, at the, and after a while it got really frustrating. I was like, why am I even here? You know, I, I, I don't know. Just doing a fancy vacuum beef hot dog is that really what I want to do? No, it's not. You know, um, so from there I moved over to uh, Manhattan. Uh, I, I took over the kitchen at Seasonal, which is a one Michelin star restaurant, um, German, Austrian inf in, uh, influence, um, and I was there for uh, about three and a half years. Um, where uh, this is where I started um, being more into going more into the vegetable-driven uh, cuisine that I that I do now. Um, and at, at that time, basically just not just, but um, mainly because my boss was telling me that I have to cut my food cost. So, <laughs> and then I was like, all right, then it's vegetables it is, you know? It's, and, then, you know and then I came up with a, with, a new, with, a, with a first dish, basically, I called a, um, it was a celery root, and, a, and the celery green, basically, and I called it celery hat to toe, uh, where basically um, I utilized the whole thing. Um, I made a puree out of the celery root. Uh, I made a stock and a juice out of the, the celery stock and the skin. Um, so, um, and I served that with uh, foie gras. You know, that, that was my, my thing to, you know, I could justify the price of the foie gras because the celery was pretty cheap, you know. <laughs> so that was my way to, to sneak the foie gras on that menu and it worked out pretty well. Um, now that was, that, you know, that was great. Uh, we, we did um, a lot of nice things there. Um, uh, we had a, uh, we had a lunch and dinner, so we were open seven days a week, and running a kitchen like that is pretty intense. Um, uh, especially, you know, we had four or five guys. Sometimes, uh, in some seasons, you know, it's just New York, it's like just like Jackson, you have flaky employees. Uh, it's not that they go, it's not that they go skiing or anything, you know, but uh, they just don't come, they don't show up or whatever it is. Um, so, you know, it's a really hands-on, I've, I've always been a hands-on chef, I've never, you know, I don't like running around with a clipboard and just, you know, and just doing things, I, I, need to, I need to be involved, I need to be, I need to touch every product that goes on the plate. This is, uh, part of me is probably a control freak, but the other, the other part is just the, the, this is the love for the food that I have, you know, that's what I want to do. Um, yeah, uh, let's, let's start a little bit, I want to show you guys, I want to talk about the rows, what we're doing now. So. Um, um, maybe I'm, I have to tell this part real quick. How did I get to Wyoming? That's a good, good point. I'm sorry about that. I want to talk about this so bad. Uh, <laughs> so uh, after so the season, uh, I took a job. Um, I got hired at Hospoda on the Upper East Side to actually, um, they wanted to, to get a mission start. They wanted to, to elevate their, their restaurant. So uh, I was there for a year, um, changing the menu. We were really on a good course, uh, but they decided like, from one day to the other, just pulling the plug and or closing the restaurant. Uh, which for me at that time was just, okay, um, you know, me and my wife, we, at that time our son was one year old, um, and we were, we were okay, maybe, maybe we can take this opportunity to leave, uh, leave, leave the city and just maybe find a nicer place to, for our son to grow up and for us to be less stressed with all the stuff. You know? Work will still be stressful, but all the rest will be, might be a little bit easier for us. Um, so uh, I got a job offer at the Cake Bread Ranch down in Thane, um, and basically, like two months later, I moved out there. Or we moved out. So it was August uh, last year, um, and I opened the restaurant um, with Jean Pierre. He came from New York too with his family, um, and it was great. You know, um, it's a really beautiful setting. Um, uh, it was interesting to work there. I gotta say, uh, we had fun in the first couple of months, and then everything kind of just went downhill from there. So um, I, was, I got really unhappy with uh, the way it turned out to be in. I just uh, put, in my, 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 put in the quits and said, you know, uh, end of the season, I'm going to be out and just do my own thing. Um, which, uh, you know, was, was, was a great decision because now it's for auction. Anybody, if you, if you want to buy a beautiful piece of property down there, it's probably just going to be like 50 million or something. 
uh, <laughs> um, that was, and after this, after I left that, it was probably one of the toughest times in my life. Um, you know, you, you, we moved the, I moved my family out here. The job didn't work out. Um, and then, you know, I tried, I started Pioneer JH, which um, basically was like, you know, private chefing, and uh, I did a couple of pop-ups. I did a pop -up, two, two pop-ups at the Ring Halls Gallery in Jackson, one in January, one in uh, February, um, and uh, two at the Rose, the, which is how I got into contact with Dom, the owner. Um, but, you know, I had so much time on my hands to try to figure out, like, okay, what can I do? How, to, how can I get back on my feet? Um, so, and I was thinking, okay, what's around here? What's going on? So I started with thinking about, okay, the new mountain cuisine. Um, this, is, this is how I call it, the new mountain cuisine, because um, I'm, I was looking around, what do we have here? What, what grows here? What, what can we utilize? And um, what, what doesn't get utilized? And, um, you know, my first dish from the New Mountain Cuisine was a, is a winter, Wyoming winter gazpacho, that's what I call it. It's a, it's a gazpacho made out of um, uh, beets, apples, and celery. So, you know, it's the same, it's the same uh, theory behind a gazpacho. You have the vegetables, but it's actually vegetables that you could get, whoopsie, get around here. Um, maybe uh, apples not that, that close, maybe just in a day drive, but um, it's, it's pretty local. You know, um, and this is and this idea just uh, went went further on into the new mountain cuisine, um, which we're actually doing now at the Rose. So I did my last pop up. I did at the Rose a um, uh, couple. I, I didn't even can't remember four months ago maybe, and um, you know a, a day later Dom came to me and he said, you know, I have this kitchen here, uh, we have this space, but we're not using it. What do you think? You know. I was like, that sounds great. You know, so we decided on, on opening three nights a week, um, which, is, which is still plenty because it's literally just me. So um, you know, it's, I do everything. 98% of all the prep, this is that's just me. Um, which is great too because I, I mentioned that control freak. You know? So um, everything, everything that goes on that plate, I touched it. I know what, where it's from. I know how it's made. You know? um, and that makes me really happy. You know, um, so you know those things are. Uh, uh, it's really interesting at times. Same thing now. I'm back to those super long days. You know, uh, most of the time I don't have anybody to talk to in the kitchen. You know, just listen to some music. Uh, but it's it's fun. You know, I feel free. I feel really happy. And I think happiness is like one of the most important parts when you when you work. You know, if if you don't do that, if it, if that work doesn't make you happy, then you. How, how can you uh, expect people to be happy eating it? That's, that's what I think, you know. Um, so, yeah, I mean, uh, the, the roast we have right now, three nights a week, um, we're doing, I have a really tiny menu. Um, tiny comparison to all the other restaurants in Jackson, you know, where I have like 40, 50 dishes on there, which is just crazy for me. And I was just thinking about it, doing that all by yourself, but they don't do that. So um, I have uh, four appetizers, three main courses, and two desserts. And I'm constantly changing with whatever the, you know, uh, right now, still in the growing season or end of the growing season, what the farmers have to provide. You know, so I, I, don't, I don't go to the farmers and, and say, hey, I need this and this and this. I tell them, okay, tell me what you got. And I cook with that. And I, I, I create that menu um, after that. Um, but I will get back to this um, in a minute. Um, so. That, that pop-up, basically, that, that's a dish from that pop-up. That was one of the first snacks that we did. It's a nasturtium flower and nasturtium leaf with uh, sour cream. The sour cream I make, I make as well. So basically, the sour cream is the first step for the butter. Right? It's, uh, it's Reed's heavy cream, uh, heavy cream uh, from Idaho Falls. Um, and then uh, the first starter you do is basically just add a little 20% uh, of buttermilk. And then you, uh, the fermentation is basically 36 hours at room temp until the point where you, where you want it to be. You know, if you want it to be a creme fraiche or you want it to be a sour cream, it's, it's an up to you. Um, so, you know, I wanted to, my dishes need to be, or I'm really vegetable driven in that case, I want those vegetables to taste like that actual vegetable. You know, I don't wanna, I don't wanna alter with them too, too much, I want them to, to shine. Um, so this is basically, you know, um, just an nasturtium flour filled with a little sour cream and Tasmanian pepper. And the same on the side, you have um, a little punched out leaf of it with sour cream and Tasmanian pepper. You know, it's, it's, really, it's a really nice um, um, combination because the nasturtium is kind of bitter. It has a little spice to it, almost like a radish. 
Um, the sour cream has a little sweetness and, and uh, acid to it. Um, so that was just a great start to, to start the, the, the dinner. You know? um, when, I, when I started with, um, when I came up with the idea of Newman Cuisine, you know, me and my wife were just, okay, how are we going to do this for those pop-ups? Uh, and she was so, so kind, she was looking up um, local artists. So I wanted to be everything local, as local as possible. So uh, we found uh, Jenny Dowd down from Alpine, an artist, um, and she, she made those plates. And um, she, we talked to her and she was so excited to work with me that you know, she basically just said, here, plates, take them. You know, just <laughs> go for it. So uh, we used them for all the pop-ups and now we're also using them for the restaurant. Um, so that's the early spring. Um, you know, my wife gets really annoyed with me when we're like taking a walk or something because I like pick herbs up and, and flowers and you know and, and say, oh, oh lamb's quarter, you know. She's like, ah, oh, whatever, you know, because usually we end up with like a whole bag and taking it home, you know, and then it's all the dirt on the camp. Yeah, I, I understand why, but uh, <laughs> I was really obsessed in the beginning of the year with uh, dandelion. Um, I wanted to. Uh, I started a work share too at the at Evergreen Farm down in Smoot, and first thing we did was weeding the the greenhouses, and there were so many beautiful dandelion flowers and actual um, dandelions, so I, t t I tried playing around with it, you know, just basically preparing me for. I knew I had no outlet right now to use it for. I, at that point, I didn't know what's going to happen at the rows, whatever. So. I just wanted to be ready. I had the time, so um, I played around with it. So I, I, pickled, um, I pickled the dandelions, and, and I also used the actual dandelion, um, and it's just sauteed quickly with uh, honey, vinegar, and olive oil. A little bit of uh, salt, it's delicious. You know, you have the bitterness, uh, your local honey, and then the flowers, are just the flower petals are just put on top. So um, this, you know, again, I didn't have really an outlet to, um, uh, to use it this year, but I, got, I have those recipes ready for, so hopefully next year in the spring I can use those things in the, at the roads, you know. Um, and the beauty of that, this is not the side of the street dandelion that you see when you go up the 89, you know. This is, this is like greenhouse, nice dandelion. <laughs> just, just so you know, you know. So, you know, and uh, Tara, the, uh, the owner of the Evergreen Farm, she was, she was really, like, first time when I said, can I take those dandelions home, she looked at me like, what? What, what do you want with those wheats? You know, and then I, then I, then I showed her the pictures and I told her and explained it to her, and you know, and now she's walking over the farm with a completely different uh, like view. You know, I mean, of course, I mean the farm is so much work and there's so many other things you have to worry about. The last thing you want to worry about is a freaking dandelion flower hanging out there. You know, and then this crazy German guy coming picking them and <laughs> and pickling them. You know, so. Uh, one, one other thing that I looked into that's, that's grown in the farm wild as well, it's, it's called wheat, it's a um, um, uh, wild salsify. Uh, so salsify is, is basically, uh, it's a nice root vegetable. Usually it grows, you know, if you get it commercially, it, it grows like this long. Um, and it's super delicious, really nice, uh, springy, wintry um, uh, vegetable. And those are actually from my front yard. So uh, that, was, that was a lot of fun, uh, you know, just playing around with that. Um, those are um, uh, arrowroot, uh, not arrowroot, is it arrow leaf? Arrow leaf petals. I always mix that up. So one day I was driving up, you know, my commute is up and down from Star Valley. Um, so I was, I was going through the, the canyon, and the first thing, basically, I think right with the dandelion that actually blooms is, is the arrow leaf. Arrow leaves, you see that all over. You know, they look a little bit like sunflowers. Um, and I was like, okay, let's, I did a little research. I know that you know, back in the days they used the roots, they, they, they cooked them down and, and ate them. Uh, but for this year, I just started with, with the petals, playing around with the petals, and I pickled them in a, in a uh, like quite sweet solution, like a simple syrup with a little vinegar in it. Um, and they actually taste like uh, uh, melons, like cantaloupe melons. It's amazing. Like it's, it's really, I was, I was blown away by it. So. Um, you know, one, one next thing, or one, one more thing for next year to, to put on the menu. Um, so this is uh, a trout dish, which uh, basically it's, it's the Idaho trout, but you, you know, utilizing the whole animal and such. Uh, you have a trout skin chip, a trout tartare, a trout roe, and then fresh horseradish, and just some dill. 
Um, so it's, it's, it's a nice little snack, obviously. It's not a, it's not a full dish. Um, uh, that, was, that was the second snack for the pop-up that, that I did. Um, and you, you see the, the, the wood that it's on. It's basically driftwood that I collected down from the uh, Palisades and Alpine and cut it to the right pieces and uh, finished it with mineral oil and beeswax. So all the plates and, and uh, everything that there, there's food on at the roads is either made by me or in Mother Nature, of course, thank you, <laughs> and, uh, and Jenny Doubt. So um, one other example for what's actually going on, uh, going, going on around here in the springtime, this is down in Thane, uh, Fall Creek Road. Uh, no, it's Fall Creek, yeah, um, Wild Watercress. You know, you just walk up 20 minutes up that creek, and uh, this is, it's, it was amazing. You know, I've, I had like three full garbage bags of wild watercress. You know, at that time too, I didn't have an outlet for it, so we had a nice, we had watercress salad for like two weeks <laughs> at home, and and I actually brought some over to Chef Drew at the Snake River Grill. He was really into it. So, um, and then next thing is uh, wild juniper berries, something I'm, uh, you know grows all around here too. They, those are immature juniper berries, so you, from that stage they usually take another year to, uh, to mature, which when you take them off, you dehydrate them and use them for, as a spice. Uh, what I did with those, I pickled those, so they're still pickling, um, and uh, it's basically, I mean, if you bite on one of those now, it's, it's, it's almost like you, you, you bite into a shot of gin, you know, what without getting tipsy. So. It's, it's, it's delicious, you know, and um, I actually use the, the branches as well to uh, smoke um, my bacon. So, uh, spring two, spruce tips. Um, spruce tips I, I collected not a lot this year, but um, you know, just to get it started as well. Probably like a pound, uh, dehydrated them, and I used them. And uh, like for example, the gummy bears uh, last night, whoever was there for dinner. Uh, they were coated in sugar, citric acid, and uh, the powdered um, uh, spruce tips. Um, so this is just a picture of the Evergreen Farm. You know, I just wanted to, you know, uh, show you guys what's 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 happening there. So I'm usually there five days, uh, five hours a week, uh, with tons of other work shares. You know, it's it's always it's not always fun. Sometimes it's really annoying because you're weeding for five hours. Um, but most of the time it's a lot of fun and it's, for me it's just a great learning experience to actually see the, the, um, the vegetable from, from seed to this and to, to the point where it goes on the plate. You know? And then uh, I think that's, for, for a chef that's just the most important part. You know? it's, like, it's like going to, you know, you have to, I think, I believe you have to watch how they slaughter a pig. You have to watch how do they slaughter a cow. You just have to see that. You know, just to understand and to respect where that actually is coming from. That wasn't, that wasn't, uh, uh, you know, it was alive one day. So uh, squash, we had tons of squash down there. Um, and then, so Jenny Doubt uh, and I talked like six months ago um, about uh, new plates, so a little bit more um, natural, you know, uh, uh, I was talking about the shapes, you know, those shapes are easier for me to plate on. The other plates are a little bit more like little bowls. So, and those are the new plates uh, that she came up with. Um, love them. So this is, um, this is a salad and this is an example of how local we are at the Rose. Like this salad is like 95% local. The only thing that is not local on this is the olive oil and the vinegar that I use. That's it. So the salt that I use is from, uh, it's called Yellowstone Natural Salt. It's down from Smoot. It's a natural spring, natural mineral spring. And they, uh, they take that spring water and um, use a hot spring uh, in Auburn um, and they run it after, uh, underneath the, the, um, uh, the greenhouse to evaporate the water into, and then actually harvest the salt. So this is one of the na most natural salts you can, you can find. You know, if you have like mine salt, you, you usually have like, uh, uh, like little things of dynamite in there. You know, you don't even know what you eat, you know? Uh, like a sea salt, I'm not a fan anymore because with all the pollution in the sea. So um, in, with this salt, I can literally say, I know where this is coming from, you know, and this is it's good stuff. So um, yeah, that's, that's just one example of like how local we go. With the salad, it's probably, uh, you know, it varies from dishes to dishes, really what's, what it is and from week to week uh, in a availability. Obviously, in the, in the winter, I will have trouble finding lettuce and kale locally, but which I don't have a problem with. That's fine, as long as I utilize and use it through, through the growing season. Um, 
one other thing that I do is um, I make, make the bread as well. It's a, it's a quick sourdough bread. Um, organic flour, yeast, vinegar, and beer. That's what in there is, is in there. So it's, you really, this is like really German style beer. Um, did you guys have that last night, right? Good beer, uh, good bread? Good bread, good bread. <laughs> and then, uh, so that, this is one of the dishes. Uh, this is a beef tartar. Uh, beef tartar, um, and then underneath here you have an egg cream, and then it's covered with Mitsuna and Cosmo flowers, uh, and a mustard oil right here. So um, here, the, the beef in that ca case is um, Kata country. The egg is from Generation Farms. Mitsuna is from Hadley Farms, um, and the Cosmos as well. So almost 90% local, you know? That's just what it is. The olive oil and the mustard is not, not yet. Yeah. <laughs> trout dish, um, this is a, I had that, this was probably two weeks ago. So it's an Idaho trout. Um, I would love to use local trout, obviously, like go fishing and do that, or have somebody go fishing for me, but we're not allowed to do that. You know, you're not, you're not allowed to have, um, any wild uh, animals, like you know, deer. I can't just have a hunter drop off the, the elk and uh, just cook it. So uh, this is a farm-raised trout, but it's a great product down um, from Idaho, um, and that was served with a with a butter sauce, uh, which made it with my butter, um, honey crisp apples, cabbage, and potatoes. Potatoes were from Evergreen Farms. Really nice there because I can remember four months ago when we planted those. You know, I was and my knees still hurt from that. So. <laughs> Not a spring chicken anymore, you know? <laughs> and then <laughs> cabbage is Hadley Farms, um, and uh, you know, I got some dill flowers on there and some dill, which is ma was mainly from um, a full circle farm in Victor and uh, Hadley Farms as well. Um, this is just uh, one thing you know, th that I didn't know. Um, like mainly, if you grow tomatoes, you grow, uh, you grow the basil right with it. You know, it's usually like when you, if you, if you grow beans, you grow uh, like um, um, uh, savory with it too. So it's just, it's just all those things that I learned now um, where beforehand you just call a purveyor and just say, I need four ounces of this, five ounces of this, well, I don't care what grows, bah. You know? <laughs> now I know exactly where everything grows and I really care about it. Um, so this is a new dessert. Um, another um, example of what I do with, with um, with, with vegetables or fruits or whatever it is. This is just apple, basically almost just apple. Uh, it's an apple, a honey crisp apple sorbet. It's a honey crisp um, apple terrine right here. And um, it's, this is basically like an um, apple cider sauce, but instead of apple cider, I used um, a, a pilsner. So it's basically apple, butter, and pilsner, and then just blend it up. Um, and this is, a, I call it an almost burned sour cream. So the sour cream that I use, you know how to make brown butter, so you basically, what you do is you, you, you heat it up to a point where the, um, the milk solids just caramelize, and it's got this really nutty taste to it. Um, and I do the same thing with, um, with the sour cream, and it just tastes, tastes bananas on that thing, uh, even though it's apple. So, <laughs> um, yeah, that's, that's one, of the, um, one of the examples, just, you know, I try to, usually I try to not use more than four components on a dish. Um, which sometimes it's tough, sometimes it just works, works fine. Um, and this is um, the smoked trout. Um, it's basically a Yellowstone salt cured and then slightly smoked trout um, with a dill mayonnaise you see on here. It's uh, served with uh, beets and uh, basically beets in various forms. You have uh, those orange, uh, those, those uh, yellow beets are roasted and then marinated in a Chardonnay vinegar. Those beets are from Evergreen Farms. Uh, the red beets are roasted and then uh, marinated in a um, Cabernet vinegar um, vinaigrette. Um, and there's a beet puree underneath, uh, which is also from the red beets. And those red beets are from Hadley Farms. Um, beet greens, you know, some dill. Um, yeah, and that's, that's basically it. So it's, you know, it has a little, it goes a little bit into like a little, you know, it has a, those German flavors in there that I like, you know, we add a lot of dill and beets. Um, Oh, especially my mom loved that a lot. So, um, yeah, that's, that's just uh, one of the examples. Let's go to this guy here. So um, farms, uh, relationships with farms, is, I think it's really, really important. Um, and I think not enough people do that, in my opinion. Um, you know, I, I don't want to tell anybody what to do, but I did, looked at a st statistic. There are 1,300 restaurants in Wyoming, and there are around 11,000 farms. I mean, obviously, some of them are... Um, you know, don't necessarily grow everything that you can just go there and, 
and cook something with, um, which is sadly enough most of the time. Um, uh, but I think you know what what I do is I try to be as um, you know, as helpful with, with the relationship with the farmers as, as I possibly can. As I said before, I'm not going to tell them what I want. I tell them, I tell them to tell me what they have. And then when you start building this relationship, now I'm at a point with, for example, had of these, where um, we're thinking about, okay, what can we grow for you next year? You know, and then next year we're going to go even more into that. You know, but you can't just come in and, and say, oh, here we're doing farm to table now, farm to table, which I, this this. It's a terrible uh, term, I think, anyways. I think we should, I mean, literally we do that every day. So it should be local or hyper-local. That's what I call that. That's what I do. You know, farm to table, I think it's, it hasn't lost its meaning. Well, you know, everybody calls it farm to table and it's, it's just not really what, what the belief was behind there. Um, um, relationships with the farmers, uh, you know, for me, you know, there was, I think there are probably around here 20 farms that I could work with. Uh, for the first year, I decided to, to, you know, to cap it with like six, seven, you know. And you know, people are asking me like, "Well, did you did you talk to him yet? Or did you talk to her yet? Or did you, you know?" So that, just take it one step at a time. You know, I want to, I, I don't want to overdo that um, either. I want to make sure that I have a nice relationship with everybody, and everybody knows what I'm doing, and they understand. So, <laughs> so they might be able to, you know, uh, accommodate me a little bit better, you know, instead of just going wild and just grab everything from everywhere, which is. Uh, kind of complicated anyways, you know, most of the times I have to pick up the eggs in Bedford uh, from Robinson Farms, you know, uh, not everybody delivers, you know, so that's just what it is. Do you have any questions? Yes. Uh, so with the, uh, with the popularity of people like, you know, Brad Ackett or you mentioned Wild and Frame, yeah. have you found that you are incorporating any of these molecular or uh, Oh, I do because you know Amador uh, was pretty much one of the first guys who did that in Germany, and we use a lot of new techniques. Um, uh, and I, but I use them really, really um, thoughtful. I would say more thoughtful. So you, you don't see like a gel and a foam and stuff on my plates. You know, I'm, I use some binding agents. You know, some algaes or uh, like agar agar or iota or whatever it is. Um, just to make my life easier, yeah, and to get a, get a, a texture that I want, yeah. Also, you know, uh, with um, um, you know low low temperature cooking, like the sous vide, which basically you know sous vide means under pressure. That means I would have to cryovac it. So I, I don't have a cryovac machine, but I usually you know I cook my trout, I poach my trout at 52 degrees Celsius, for example. So yes, I, I definitely do that. Yeah. Yes. When you're creating a new dish. Do you trust your own palate or do you taste it? I'm uh, fortunate to say that um, most of the time a dish starts right here. I put those things together and 80% of the time it works out just fine. Or even better than I expected. Um, so I don't really go around and say, hey, what do you think? You know, um, I sometimes do that just to be nice. <laughs> <laughs> Just to, or you know, sometimes you know, with, with, with our servers and stuff, you know, I want them to be to feel more involved in, in my creative process too. But the way that my creative process works is that I have to be by myself in some sort, you know. Or like you know, uh, with my, my sous chefs in New York, you know, we were basically basically on the same level, and we would just shoot ideas back and forth, and then we would try that together. But but yeah, usually I don't do that. Usually it's just uh, it's just me. Yeah. Yes. The arrow. It's like a cantaloupe melon almost. Like really, like, yeah, like a melon. Delicious. Yes? Do you feel like you could affect change in the, you know, say go fishing for the trout that you want to use or harvesting the elk that you want to use and, you know, broaden, be able to broaden your basis? I mean, I totally understand the reasons that those rules are in place, but it seems like it also is impacting someone like you rather negatively. Yeah, no, uh, for sure it is. Um, I had I had a long conversations with the uh, health inspectors about that, you know, just to, to try to find a loophole there to you know. Uh, their main concern is just obviously if you, when you shoot that elk, for example, out in the like three hours into the woods, you know, there's no cool chain in that. You know, it's just going to lay on the truck. It's going to roll through the dirt. So um, uh, ideally, you know, I just have to stop my own elk farm, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yes. 
have you thought about with, with your um, seasonal and finding the watercress and the dandelions and things like that, because we try to mitigate in, um, invasive species in the environment here, have you thought about finding uses for the invasive species? Yeah, I don't, I don't even think that's a, that's a bad thing. Yeah, I like that. You know, it's, it's, it's just for me, um, I just need to, I don't have the resources to, you know, I, you know, I, I, I go foraging for things that I know for sure. You know, I just don't go around, and go, oh, this might be great, and then just, you know, lay in bed for five days, you know. So if I, if I find the right, the, the right person or the right people that, that educate me on those things, you know, uh, I would love to do that. I think that's, that's a great, great way to approach those things, yeah. Yeah. Anybody else? How do you make your butter? Oh, basically, um, Reed's heavy cream from Idaho Falls. 20% uh, butter milk. This is how you start it. Um, and then you ferment it. Basically, the fermented process is about 38 hours at 62 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, you, will, you will see that uh, um, you know, after 36 six hours, you have like a sour cream. If you want to keep it longer, you, you make like a, a creme fraiche, almost like the thickness of it. Um, and then what you do, you, you refrigerate it. And then you basically put it in a, in a mixer. I have this big Holbert blender. And you just mix it up until basically the buttermilk and the, the fat um, splits or breaks. And then you have buttermilk and butter solids. And then you just strain it out, squeeze it out. And uh, you have use, I use the buttermilk for the, uh, for the desserts mostly. And uh, the butter is just rolled up and is waiting to be eaten. <laughs> Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me.